that's why this doesn't leak anymore right here, and that's why I'm getting oil. Well, one of the reasons why I'm getting oil out at the top, which is what we want. The other thing you want to look for is the rotation. If these are spinning, we're good. If they're not, we're not. And they're all rotating happily. Look at them go. Like, Yay! We love life right now. So we're going to go over the oil system. Most of these motors die because lack of oil, oil maintenance, or oiling components that Toyota design that fail because of lack of maintenance. So the rule book says for an F, you have to have 40 to 50 PSI at 2400-ish RPMs. I would obviously like 50 PSI, 2400-ish RPMs. The controlling of that is a couple of things. One, there's that little regulator down in there. Okay, it has a plunger on the back side of this, down in this thing. There's a little spring and a bunch of other gibberish. Anyway, this is adjustable to control your PSI. And your PSI is important at a certain RPM. And if those get stuck open or closed, your, your motor fails. It goes kaboom. So we want verbatim from the book about 2400 R's at 50 PSI. And whatever the idle is, PSI is what the idle is PSI. And that depends on if the motor has been worn out, bearings are worn out, lack of maintenance, so on and so forth. Now, the oil that we run is a parcel synthetic Joe Gibbs 15 W40 motor oil with a mobile one filter. And that oil still has dinosaur bones in it, even though it's, it's a parcel synthetic, so it's got some man-made isms in there for a reason but we want the best oil possible because this one's only 20 psi warm at idle which i wouldn't want anything less than that so we're probably still good but that's just an indication to me that cam bearings aren't as tight as they once were main bearings aren't as tight as they once were rod bearings aren't as tight as they once were which is which is fine that's of age but the critical component in my opinion is when you're cruising down the highway at the 2F happy spot or F happy spot, which is, you know, two grand to mid 2000, somewhere around in there, you want 50 PSI. So after 50 PSI, Toyota designed this thing to bypass the oil filter system. So that little guy will basically do a little slot machined into the backside. Anyway, the oil will no longer, after 50 PSI, will no longer go through this. And only 50% of the oil normally, between 20 and 50, is going through this anyway. So it is absolutely critical that you do valve adjustments, you keep track of what that number is, and if you don't have that gauge at your house, which most people don't because it's a British pipe thread, right? At the oil sender, it's 8th inch BSPT instead of NPT, which everyone thinks it is, or they'll shove a brass fitting in there. Anyway, we can document where the needle is on the gauge for that PSI and the 50 PSI so people get a, a good idea of what that could be technically on their cluster. Does that make sense? So they have an idea because if they don't have that with the special fitting, then anyway. But we always want to make sure these things will have oil pressure, and this is a good start to numerically know what it actually is. And if your needle on your gauge is, you know, going down from this normality, then either that thing needs to be adjusted or your oil's deteriorated or your filter's failing. And that's why we only use those so they don't fail. There's the brass tube that comes up and it goes to a T and that T has an O-ring on the backside rocker shaft and the front side rocker shaft. And that's the sealing point for all of the rockers. So all the oil comes up through the brass, to the T, seals through the O-ring, goes through the center bore of the rocker shafts and up and out the bushings of the rocker arms and up and over the rocker arms and on the push rods. You're gonna lose pressure and or volume up here too. If the brass bushings of those rocker arms are plumb more out or if those O-rings are bad. And it just so happens we took a lot of time and money to figure out which O-rings those 
car and we have them now and then this had bad o-rings how how bad were they they were a quarter inch section of the o-ring was gone yeah. right so on the back side of the rocker we're priming this sucker and oil just pouring out of the back side of the rocker on the back half the front half it was actually still coming up over the rockers but the back half rockers were upset so i put new o-rings and all that stuff and that changed the game for the oil up here however since the bronze bushings are no longer new and they're 50 years old we're losing a little bit of oil when the rockers rotate down at the bottom pivot point because the valve adjustment let's say they weren't adjusting their valves when they should have and so on and so forth so i gotta watch out for that so that's basically the gist of how these things need to operate from an oil pressure perspective to keep them alive those are the main components. Yeah, see? That one, that one, that one. Oh, taking photos for the customer so he knows what we're doing and how we're doing it. They designed that carburetor for this motor. Yes, you can do other things for an F, later model carburetors, Holly snipers, whatever. But, but you really like these two. When it's a revival service job, you know, this job was to upgrade certain things to make it happy for the customer to drive, right, without busting the bank. So there's nothing wrong with these carburetors. No. They just need to be no, dialed some guys, in. Some guys hate them because, you know, let's say they don't flow as much CFM as a later model carburetor. They've got a weighted secondary instead of a vacuum secondary or whatever. Fine. I get it. I completely agree with them. I do understand that. However, when you have something from 1970 or 1971, and it's legit and it works right, I mean, how can you not be happy with it? Right. I mean, I love modifying things, there's no question. And I, I mean, I like both ends of that spectrum. Right. You know, I like the patina, I like the restoration, I like the swaps, I like the upgrades, I like keeping it real. I, I don't know, I like all of it. So, roughly, like I know getting carburetors rebuilt takes quite a while, but why do we go to such lengths to have these carburetors rebuilt? It's kind of the same premise. Who can go in there and understand a carburetor and figure out why it does what, make it a little bit better, and know that it's going to work perfectly? And that's a, it's, a, it's an art that is almost gone. You know, and it, that's for any demographic, whether it's a guy that loves Rochester's or Carter's or Weber's or whatever, or Quadra Junks, quote unquote. That's, that's their thing, that's their hobby. That's what they love, and I just love these dumb little cars. They, they work in the mountains. They're no horsepower freaks. They don't, they're not progressive, they... So talk about that in the mountains. Why is that so important? Especially for us here at Well, 6, we're, we're at 6,800 feet, and then we go from 68 to, you know, 10 or 11. And granted, when you get past 10, no matter what carburetor you have, you're gonna start having problems. It's coming past 10. So why does this carburetor work so well, well at elevation? Well, these things were literally designed to be bounced around up hills, down hills, right? They figured out how to keep the fuel in the bowl and so on and so forth, right? With a racing carburetor, they're not that way. You get a certain angle and they get pissed. Yeah. They get, you know, the, the bowl goes out and overflows and it goes out the vent tube and, you know, your truck dies and down the hill you go and you're dead, right? These things just, they, they were designed to be bounced around in mountains, whether no matter what the elevation, let's say it was a 4,000 foot mountain in Washington state. Fine, great. A Weber's still not gonna perform in the mountains like these are, mm. from a wheeling perspective. They're just not. Yeah. They're little billy goats, man. That's what these things are. Yeah, they designed jets so you could go to a high elevation or low elevation, right? Different jet sizes. Uh, the cool thing with Toyota is they put the jets in here in the early carburetors, so you have them with you. And they put them where you can change them. So you, you know, the, the, the jets that are actually in the carburetor are back here, so you have a straight shot to those jets to change, which is cool because, I mean, otherwise you've got to carry a little satchel or a bag or whatever with jets in it. Okay, fine, but I mean, they thought about being able to service your vehicle, whether it's an elevation change or changing your tire. In this era, you were supposed to fix your stuff, not the dealer. You're supposed to be able to fix this thing in the middle of nowhere and get the job done, period. This is the sure. drain for the actual float bowl and on the back side of that drain because you got to drain the float bowl to change the jets yeah they got jets that, the jet the high elevation jets yep. actually live on the back side of that bowl it's a holder mm -hmm. 
You know, with a Holly, the whole front face comes off. You got these seals and stuff. You can change yeah. the jets and we put it back in. But a Holly's a, you know, it's not a Billy Goat carburetor. Yeah. They were Amazing. over designed <laughs> compared to other models. They're fantastic. I love them. I do. They're just little Billy Goats.